So where we left off was dealing with our pirating at the very end of the glycolytic path. And so we take the glucose through those 10 steps, use two ATPs to produce four ATPs, which is a net of two ATPs being produced by substrate level phosphorylation. And we also generate that one NAD plus. We reduce the NAD plus to the NADH. And we're left over with pyruvate. How many pyruvates do I have from a single molecule of glucose? Double it. I'm going to have two pyruvates from each molecule of glucose. So really, I can transport in two pyruvates into the mitochondria. Now, when you look at the mitochondria, which is going to be the home to the Krebs cycle and to the electron transport chain, the mitochondria is going to have an outer membrane and then it's going to have an inner membrane. And the inner membrane has got a lot of holes to increase surface area. Okay? So this is a mitochondria. And we're going to have an outer membrane. And I'm going to have an inner membrane. And then a space in between the membranes called the intermembranous space. And then the very inside is called the matrix. Okay? So you kind of have to keep the anatomy in mind here as we're going through this whole process. So here you can see that I have my outer membrane, my inner membrane, here's my space kind of in that rusty orange color, and then this would be the matrix. Out here is the cytosol. My two pyruvates are going to have to be transported through both of those membranes into the matrix. Once it's in the matrix, this is where the Krebs cycle is going to occur. So I'll put a little circle in there to represent the Krebs cycle. The four uh, proteins and, and lipids that are involved in the electron transport chain, there are four complexes. And then we have this little molecule called ATP synthase where we pass electrons through and then we end up with oxygen here so that we can generate ATP. We're going to look at all this in a lot more detail. That is it. So this is the electron transport chain, ETC, in the, inter, in the inner membrane. Okay? Just kind of trying to give you an over, full overview. So when I take the pyruvate and I move it in, I have to go through this pyruvate transport. So that should have been the last thing that you had to know. So pyruvate transport into the mitochondria. This pyruvate transport is going to require a transport protein. So here's that transport protein. And what happens is you can see I have a carboxyl group here that the pyruvate, as it goes through that transport protein, it's going to be removed. The carboxyl group is removed as carbon dioxide. So I lose two oxygens and a carbon as we transport through. I'm also going to exchange some electrons. So I'm going to lose some electrons, pass those off to NAD+, I'm going to reduce that NAD+, to form NADH. So as we move through that transport protein, carbon dioxide is removed from the pyruvate. The CO2 that you respire back out during respiration is being produced right here. So this is the CO2 that you can breathe back out of waste. The next part of that transport process is for an electron to be exchanged. So this is an oxidation reduction. CO2 is off, so I'm left over with the C uh, in the O and the CH3. We exchange an electron. This is my oxidizing agent. This is my reduced sub substrate over here. So I exchange the electron from here to here. So NADH is going to be reduced. And that always forms NADH plus we end up with a hydrogen ion or a proton. How in the world is like someone who is a 
actually got your best place version. Like, that is so intricate. Somebody had to create it. So oh, yeah. that so fast. I <laughs> no, I agree. It's, there's, I mean, look at that. I mean, what the heck? Really? Okay. The last thing that happens, we have this little thing called coenzyme A. Coenzyme A is just going to be a pool. It's going to be pooled up inside of the mitochondria. Coenzyme A is another substrate that gets put in place. So really what's going on here is this transport protein is not only a transport protein, but it's also an enzyme that catalyzes these reactions. So coenzyme A is going to be covalently attached to that decarboxylated pyruvate. It's attached through a sulfur molecule, so it's a pretty strong bond. So it's going to be the sulfur and then the coenzyme A. The molecule that's formed after we've removed the carbon, exchanged an electron, and added on coenzyme A is this molecule called acetyl-CoA. So through that pyruvate exchange or pyruvate transport into the mitochondria, we're now going to begin to have acetyl-CoA levels increasing because of that exchange. It's going to be this acetyl-CoA after its transport that is the starting substrate that enters the Krebs cycle. Enters the Krebs cycle. Now, so I'm going to remind you real quick. For each molecule of glucose, how many acetyl-CoA molecules am I producing? Two. Remember, glucose has how many carbons? Six. Six carbons. C6, H12, O6. How many carbons do I have here in pyruvate? One, two, three. If I follow the rules of thermodynamics, it says that matter can even be created from and destroyed, so I have to account for those carbons. I can't destroy them. So it's not just uh, producing one three carbon molecule, it's producing three, two three carbon molecules. So from each molecule of glucose, I really have two acetyl-CoA's that go in. Each acetyl-CoA can go through the Krebs cycle one time. So I can rotate the Krebs cycle twice from each molecule of glucose. Keep this in mind. This is going to become critical as you begin to go through this process of learning these pathways. Okay, so here's the Krebs cycle. Here's our pyruvate transported into form acetyl-CoA. Um, again, probably not really all that visible, but we have eight different steps here around the Krebs cycle from acetyl-CoA all the way through. And really what's happening is acetyl-CoA combines with the end product of the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle to form this molecule called citric. So this is going to be the place that we're going to start is the citric or citric acid. Hence the name citric acid cycle. So acetyl-CoA and oxaloacetate enzymatically combine to form citric acid, and then we go through the process of converting that citrate into multiple substrates until we get back to oxaloacetate. How many times can I go around this for one molecule of glucose? Shot my neighbor's dog this morning. Is anyone paying attention? <laughs> How many times can we go around for one molecule of glucose? Twice. Two times. So that acetyl CoA is going to enter the Krebs cycle. In the Krebs cycle, 
we have eight substrates. And enzymes. So eight different reactions that are going to be catalyzed. The big thing about the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle, or sometimes also called the tricarboxylic acid cycle, is for every time it goes through for citrate all the way back to oxaloacetate, you have these reactions here that are occurring. One here for producing uh, uh, GTP, which eventually gets converted into ATP, and then we have one more here. Uh, so we have an NADH reaction here, we have one here, we have one here, and we have one here. We are going through this process of basically each step along the way, we are exchanging electrons from our substrates to reduce NADH plus to the NADH. We're basically stripping off electrons as we go through the Krebs cycle. Okay? Now, for each step along the way, here's one NADH, two NADHs, three NADHs. How many NADHs do I have for one molecule of glucose? I have one, two, three, four, five, six, because I'm going around twice. Okay? So there are going to be eight substrates, and we're basically making more NADH. We're also going to have uh, FADH2 that's going to be produced, and then an ATP each time we go through the cycle. So each time we go through, we're going to get three NADHs, one FADH, and one ATP. Since the ATP is being produced here in the, in the Krebs cycle, anyone remember what we would call that? The ATP that's being produced within a pathway. What do we call that ATP? How, how, or what do we call the, the process that makes that ATP? It's at the level of the substrate. Let me see the answer. Substrate level phosphorylation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What is that NADH3? That just means that I'm producing three NADHs, one FADH2, and one ATP every time we go through the Krebs cycle, which we're going to go through twice from each molecule of glucose. Because from one molecule of glucose, how many pyruvates do you need? No. Two. two. Those two pyruvates, how many acetyl CoAs do they produce? Two. Those two acetyl CoAs, how many times? How many times does each acetyl CoA turn the Krebs cycle? Once. So how many total times? Twice we're going to turn the Krebs cycle. So one time around you get three NADHs, one FADH2, and one ATP. How about for two times around? <laughs> Math is hard to figure numbers. <laughs> Six, two, two. He <laughs> almost said right. Because he just. I didn't almost say right. I was thinking about what I wanted to say. <laughs> it was right or wrong. So that's your. That's the scariest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> and the one about the wings. It's okay in my head. That's why I did it. So we generate these NADHs, FADHs, and ATPs. Just think of the NADH and the FADH. Those are carrying electrons. Those molecules carry electrons. Where do they carry them to? They shuttle them over to the electron transport chain. So notice that I have four complexes in the electron transport chain, and then I end up here with an ATP synthase. There's a, there's a complex here as well that's not really shown. Um, so we have complex number two here. Two, three, four, five. I mean, that gets harder with bigger numbers. One, two, three, four. 
So NADH is, notice they're carrying electrons. Hopefully you can kind of see that this NADH here has electrons associated with it. Those electrons are going to be passed off to the complex one. They're going to be passed to complex number two, to number three, to number four. So the electron makes its way through the electron transport chain until we get to this point where the electrons are going to associate with oxygen and with the hy two hydrogens to create water. Now it's no longer electrons, it's no longer hydrogen, and no longer oxygen, but it's all wrapped up in water. So oxygen levels are always being pulled down inside of the cell, inside of the mitochondria. So we have to continually replace those oxygen, but that's the purpose of our oxygen system. So through the electron transport chain, Yeah, we're out of the cycle. What do we use the cycle for? What was the main purpose of the cycle? ATP. No. We only got two ATPs from a single molecule. Right, yeah. No. NADH. We're producing molecules that will carry electrons. And where do they carry them to? Over here to the electron transport chain. So we're trying to transfer the electron between increasingly, now you should be able to finish the sentence here. Why do you think the electron goes from here through these complexes over to here? It's definitely not down a concentration gradient or up a concentration gradient. What determines where an electron ends up in association with other molecules? Electronegativity. So these electrons are going to be pulled from a lower electronegative molecule, NADH, onto a slightly higher, a little bit higher, a little bit higher, a little bit higher, until we get to oxygen. Now, hopefully, it's not a huge surprise anymore why it's oxygen. Why is it oxygen? Electronegativity of oxygen is the highest that we have in a biological system. So each step along the way, these NADHs are passing their electrons off onto increasingly electronegative enzymes until we finally make our way to oxygen. So the very last step is to take that electron and to allow it to combine in the presence of a proton, hydrogen, and then oxygen. And really, oxygen that is pulling the electron towards itself because of the electronegativity to form a molecule of water. And really, it's if we look at it, it would be half an oxygen. Or in other words, we would use two electrons plus two hydrogens plus our molecular oxygen. All of this combined together to form our water. So in order for cellular respiration to occur, I'm always going to need a steady supply of oxygen. Oxygen is always going to be required. What if I remove oxygen from here? What if I no longer have adequate supply of oxygen in the mitochondria? The electrons have no place to go. So the electrons begin to back up. And it's just like a conveyor belt. If you have a, you know those belts at the, at the grocery store that you put your food on? What happens if the attendant's not there to remove the, uh, each individual food and swipe it through the scanner? It's going to eventually back up and it's going to begin to overflow. Okay? So this is going to actually stop electron flow. So if we stop electron flow, then everything else that's happening in the electron uh, transport chain stops as well. As soon as we add oxygen back in, electron flow begins, the whole system begins to ramp up. So what exactly is the electron transport chain doing? Why are we passing the electrons through? Because all that really says is the electron goes through and it combines with water, so we're just producing water. But you actually have all of this that's going on as well. 
So this is the very inside of the mitochondria. What do we call that? It's a movie, a terrible movie. The Matrix. Then what's what's this that is wrapped up the electron transport chain? It's a membrane. What kind of membrane? What, what's the name? Which one? Inner. Inner mitochondrial membrane. And then what would this feel out here? It's not the outer. The outer is going to be up here off the picture. It's the intermembranous space. So you have the matrix where the Krebs cycle is, where we're actually generating the NADHs, the FADHs. Then you have the inner membrane where the electron transport chain is bound up. And then you have the intermembranous space. Okay? When we pass an electron down these complexes towards oxygen, those complexes use the energy of the electron to pull hydrogens from the matrix into the intermembranous space. So note that we have lower hydrogen levels here, but we're pumping hydrogens through to where we have a higher concentration rate or a higher concentration level. So what we're doing is creating a hydrogen concentration gradient by allowing these electrons to facilitate the pumping of hydrogens through each complex, each of those three complexes, one, three, four, on the electron transport chain. We are using what's called the electro electrochemical force of the electron to pull the hydrogen through the complex into the intramembranous space. So we're using the force, the electrochemical force of the electron to push the hydrogen through, to go from the matrix into the intra intramembranous space. And we're creating a concentration gradient. And you all see the concentration gradient, right? High concentration of hydrogen here, lower concentration of hydrogen here. Okay? So we're creating that concentration gradient by taking hydrogens from the inner mitochondrial matrix. They, they probably do attract into the complex, and then as the electron moves towards its more electronegative, this becomes positive to repel the positron. So it pulls it in because it's attracting it, but the electron is moving that way, so the hydrogen either gets trapped and it's un chemically unfavorable to stay in, so it goes off. So we take those hydrogens from the inner mitochondrial matrix and push them into the inner membrane space, and we're forever increasing the hydrogen concentration in that intramembrane space. So here's more of, of a three-dimensional look at that mitochondria. So here's the matrix. And then in the intermembrane space, you remember I said had all of these foldings. And you're going to see that there are areas where we end up seeing uh, not only the electron transport chain, but then this molecule here, which we call ATP synthase, which has the F0 and F1 um, components, so we can call them, we also can call them the F0 F1 complex. That's the same as saying ATP synthase. So hydrogen levels inside of the matrix are, are low, in the intermembrane space are high as long as we're running the electron transport chain. If we're running the electron transport chain as long as we have adequate oxygen supply and adequate supply of electrons from the break on the Okay? So this 
concentration gradient for hydrogen, low hydrogen here, higher hydrogen here in the, in the inner membrane space. We're going to call it, it concentration gradient. We've already talked about this. What do they do? They create a force, right? A concentration gradient creates a force to create the consistent. This particular force that's been created, we're going to call it a proton. Why am I calling it a proton? Because hydrogen ions are basically protons. There's no neutron in the hydrogen. Remember that's just atomic hydrogen is just a uh, proton and electron. If we strip off the electron, we get that positively charged proton. So it's just a proton. So I'm going to call it the proton motive force. So the concentration gradient that we created is called a proton motive force. And it is a force. This is the equivalent for me taking a bucket of water down here by 115 and carrying it all the way to the top up by the cross. I now have a concentration gradient where water is over here on the hill and not over there down by 115. And even though there's gravity involved as well, if I pour the water out, it's going to move back down towards the bottom of the hill. So, in this picture here, if I created this proton motor force, if this membrane, the inner mitochondrial membrane, becomes permeable to hydrogen, how is the hydrogen going to move? It's a simple concentration gradient question. Huh? We always move from high concentration to low concentration. So we're going to move back into the mitochondrial matrix. So when the membrane becomes permeable to hydrogen, hydrogen moves from the inner membrane space back into the mitochondrial matrix. That creates a current. Right? Anytime you have ions that flow, or really anything that flows, it creates a current. And we can use that current to do work. Now check this out. I have this molecule here called ATP synthase. ATP synthase is going to use that proton motive force that we just created through the electron transportion. In other words, what I'm saying is ATP synthase is going to be the protein that allows hydrogen to move down its concentration gradient. And as it moves, as the hydrogen moves through ATP synthase, that proton motive force is going to be used to mill ATP from ADP and inorganic phosphate. Which is what you see happening here. The hydrogen moves through the ATP synthase, and in the process, we have ADP and inorganic phosphate converted into ATP, which is ultimately where we're trying to do. However, it's not that simple. How many of you have ever been to a mill, like a flower mill? Maybe fingers smell up from the smokies. You haven't been there, or some. And you have water that comes off of the spillway, lands on the water wheel, and the water wheel begins to spin, and it spins a big stone, a big grinding stone. ATP synthase is very similar. So here is a picture of ATP synthase. Here is my inner mitochondrial space, my inner membrane, and my matrix. Notice that I have multiple parts to this protein. And basically what it is, is I'm going to filter the hydrogen through this, this part here, which is going to spin. It's going to use that proton motive force to begin to rotate. As it rotates, it rotates on this part, which is like an axle. That axle begins to rotate, and it rotates within this chamber. And as it rotates, it causes that chamber to change its shape. And as it changes its shape, it pulls an ADP and an organic phosphate and changes its shape to put them into a conducive situation where we reduce the activation of energy so that they spontaneously interact to create ATP and then the ATP is released. No 
nobody is all that excited about the Olympics. So. So this process of hydrogen causing this molecular motor to operate to generate ATP is called oxidative phosphorylation. We're making that proton motor force possible because we are using oxygen to facilitate the flow of electrons through the electron transport chain to generate a proton motor force. That proton motor force that's generated causes the motor of ATP synthase to operate, which results in the production of ATP. So ATP synthase, which facilitates oxid oxidative phosphorylation. By the way, that's juxtaposed next to substrate level phosphorylation. Substrate level phosphorylation occurs where? At the level of the substrates in the chemical reactions of glycolysis and Krebs cycle. Oxidative phosphorylation occurs at ATP synthase after we've generated our proton motor force. ATP synthase consists of three parts. Okay, and those are basically the three parts that make this molecule operate. Just like in your car, you have an engine that's attached to a transmission, that's attached to an axle that makes the wheel spin around. We're going to use an engine that operates on hydrogen to spin an axle to cause a catalytic knob to perform the production of ATP or ATP. So part number one is called the cylinder or the stator. And what this cylinder or stator does is it creates a core for those hydrogen ions to begin to move back down their concentration rate. So really, you kind of have to think it of as being the hydrogen moves into a pore, and it begins to turn this stator. It begins to rotate this part of the, of the ATP surface. And as it rotates, another hydrogen comes in, and it continues to rotate, another hydrogen comes in, and pretty soon you have this flow of hydrogen in and around to be released out the body. Okay? Think of this as being that water wheel, except for it's now flipped on its on its end. The water comes in, fills up the little bucket, and causes the water wheel to begin to spin. The next little bucket on the water wheel fills up, and then the next one fills up, and pretty soon that weight of that water begins to spin that water wheel at a pretty fast speed with enough force that it can begin to rotate big cells for milling and, and, uh, and working with and operating tools. So hydrogen comes in and begins to cause this big catalytic knob here at the top to begin to spin around. And as more hydrogen comes, it spins and spins and spins, rotating that axle. So the cylinder or the stator is what's creating the pore for the hydrogen and it begins to rotate. On the other side of the protein here, we're going to have the knob. which creates the catalytic sites to bind ADP and my inorganic phosphate. So this knob binds, it has active sites for ADP and inorganic phosphate. Those active sites pick up the ADP and the inorganic phosphate, and as that cylinder or stator rotates, it causes that knob to contort, and when it contorts, it puts those two substrates close together to make the reaction conducive so that it can combine to form ATP. Now right in the middle here, this part of the molecule here, is going to be the rotor rod. Think of this as being a crankshaft. And as the cylinder rotates, 
that rotational force is imputed onto the rotor rod. So it begins to rotate in response to the rotation of the catalytic or of the uh, cylinder, the stator, because the hydrogen are pouring. This rotor rod, as it rotates about, this is a more fixed structure down here, the, the knob. The rotor rod goes into that knob, and as it rotates, it causes that knob to go through that co uh, contortion. So it causes it to change its shape. It's mechanically deforming the knob. So the rotation of the rotor rod contorts the knob. That's supposed to be knob, not the knob. So it contorts the knob. And when it contorts the knob, the knob, which has catalytic sites containing ADP and interorganic phosphate, they are going to be moved into close conformation. So we move the catalytic sites in close conformation. Now, again, we've already talked about reactions before. If I want to shake Devante's hand, and he's over there and I'm here, we're not going to be able to shake each other's hand. We have to be moved into close conformation to make that interaction happen. So by contorting the knob, you're just simply bringing the ADP and the PI closer together so you can have that, that chemical handshake called a reaction. So ADP and PI react in their favorable conditions that are created as that catalytic knob is contorted. And after they interact, they're going to form ATP, and as the rotation continues through the complete cycle, that newly formed ATP is released into the mitochondrial matrix. And so now we have a continuing increase in ATP supply. Now this is serious stuff. And I am not even going to try to sugarcoat this. This is very conceptual, very difficult to understand, but not impossible. They're going to have to do battle here. They're going to have to engage this material to make it really make sense. But just think about what's going on. You're taking glucose and you're reorganizing the bonds. And as you reorganize the bonds, the electrons take up new positions. And as they take up new positions, they're going to begin to change their potential energy states. If I change the potential energy state from one molecule to another, the difference in the potential energy is going to equate to the available energy for the free energy that can be used for work. So I am just simply taking a high potential energy molecule of glucose and I am changing its state step after step after step until I have electrons that are now associated with even lower potential energy, and then I have this difference that gives me the ability to begin to produce ATP to do work. Okay? So start out with those first steps of the glycolytic pathway. Be able to say glucose combines with hexokinase to generate glucose 6-phosphate because we catalyze the hydrolysis of ATP. From glucose 6-phosphate, we use a, uh, we use a glucose, a phosphoglucose isomerase enzyme to phosphor, uh, to isomerize glucose 6-phosphate into fructose 6-phosphate. And then we use phosphoglucose kinase 1 to convert 
fructose 6-phosphate into fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Start taking it step by step by step. Why don't we pause there? When we come back on Monday, we'll start talking about accounting for ATP. As you're packing up, are there questions that you have? Is there anything that needs to be clarified? Anything that would help you to be able to find success?